Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, so very happy to have Eli Ben Sasson here. Eli, as you may know, is visiting us for an year. And if you're lucky, we, we, he'll be in the Boston area for maybe even longer. Uh, works on various aspects of complexity theory, extracting randomness, uh, probabilistically checkable proofs. And today, he'll talk about uh, proof complexity. OK, thank you very much. So I'd like to start with a question. You know, has anyone here sat in a, a mathematical talk coming out and you know, saying, wow, that was complicated. I did not understand anything. <laughs> OK, I hope this was not, it was not one of my talks. <laughs> but uh, um, our plan is go going to be to talk about the complexity of proofs. Usually, um, <clears throat> people blame it on themselves. You know, I didn't understand the talk maybe because uh, it was, you know, I'm not smart enough, or maybe it's the uh, speaker who wasn't giving, doing a good job, but we'll actually get to blame it on the mathematical statements being proved. You know, they are to blame. Some statements are just too complicated to have any simple proofs. And that's the sort of questions that's, that are studied in uh, propositional proof complexity. Uh, we'll focus on one specific, uh, the simplest and also the most interesting and practically used and heavily investigated proof system called resolution. We'll define three complexity measures and look at the interplay between them. Um, we'll see some fundamental tools for proving um, lower bounds on the complexity of, of, of proofs, see, seeing in what cases uh, mathematical statements are hard to prove. And the main character in this part of the plot is going to be graph expansion, the expansion of, of graphs. We'll define everything later. And then we'll talk about how to get all kinds of trade-offs between these measures and understand how they relate to each other. And there will be a different uh, major character. That's going to be graph pebbling. So two things about graphs, pebbling and expansion. And they'll play roles in, in understanding the complexity of proofs. Maybe we should forward this to the PowerPoint teams, uh, the, the trade-off in PowerPoint slides to uh, accommodate various proofs. Uh, <laughs> so you know, right, as we said, sometimes <laughs> You just don't understand what's going on, and it's complicated. And <coughs> we can uh, be a bit more careful about it and ask what exactly. So what happens when you do proofs without an eraser, right? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> OK, so um, we'll look more carefully at three different aspects that informally can be defined as the length, which is, you know, so a professor comes in and gives, delivers a talk, you know, proves, let's say, one statement. E equals mc squared, something like that. So one thing he has is a bunch of papers that he's going through as he's writing uh, on the board. Let's also assume that he writes one line, like one lemma or one claim on, on, you know, on the board at a time. And the width will be, you know, what's the most complicated uh, line he ever puts? Maybe it's, you know, for all x1, there exists x2, such that for all x3, da, 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 there exists uh, x1 million. That was, that's going to be a pretty wide line. And the third thing is going to be the space. So he has an eraser. He can erase stuff when he doesn't need it anymore. And the space is the number, you know, how many lines need to be consecutively on the board in order for him to deliver the proof and convince us uh, of the statement. So three measures, the length, how much time we sit in class, uh, the width, and the space. And um, the questions we'll be asking, maybe I'll stand on this side. OK, so the questions we're going to be asking are, uh, how bad can it be? You know, given a, a mathematical statement, it's you know, some statement, it's written down, how hard can its proof be, long, wide, or spacious? Mm -hmm. Hmm? Need. <laughs> well, in, you know, what's the, so I, uh, in computational complexity, right, you can always uh, make a proof more complicated than necessary. You know, sometimes you need to do it if, if your objective is to get accept, you know, the paper accepted to some <laughs> conferences or journals. But here, you know, suppose you really want to simplify things and, and make them as easy as possible. Um, sometimes you just can't do it uh, because of the inherent properties of the statement that you're proving. And we want to understand or uh, diagnose cases where this happens. And also learn, you know, are there relations between maybe something is simple in one respect but is very complicated in another? Can we trade off these different aspects of complicated so proofs. You, a, a bigger board, you could do it in half the time. Or Something like that, exactly. Or maybe, you know, maybe the board can be very small, but you need a lot of papers. There's no way about it. Or maybe if you need few papers, you can have a small board, things like that. That's the kind of questions we want to understand. 
And I just want to say that in the context of computer science, all these questions also have practical implications because um, computers, actually, there's a huge industry that investigates um, automated proofs and SAT solving, and we'll say a bit more about that later. Microsoft. What? It's called Microsoft. Uh, <laughs> Microsoft? Uh, I thought more like uh, Intel and IBM. Do they have like formal verification and design of chips? Software and verification yeah. more okay. than hardware. Okay, so Microsoft might be one of them, and uh, there are others, and it's a huge industry, and they also care about uh, properties of proofs. Now, um, we're going to look in propositional proof complexity, because uh, if you recall what you learned about logic, so say in first order logic, a uh, mathematical statement is just a finite string. For instance, here's a Fermat's, uh, you know, the Fermat Wiles, Fermat's last theorem, Wiles theorem. Um, it's just some finite uh, string. And um, so is a proof. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense to compare how long one string, fixed string, is with respect to some other fixed string. You know. uh, moreover, if a statement is true, you can even formally add it as an axiom to your theory, and the theory would still be consistent and everything would be just the same. So really, in, in first-order logic, you don't get to, to, to ask these kinds of questions about length, width, or space. But you, rather than that, you ask about, can you prove something? And what logical needs, what uh, axioms do you need in order to get it? Do you need the axiom of choice? Can you do it without induction? Things like that. But uh, in propositional calculus, so what is propositional calculus? We look at families of tautologies. A tautology is um, um, some composition of propositions, where you have n propositions, and each proposition is like an atom that has only two values. It's either true or false. So you can think of it as a Boolean variable, one or zero. And um, now we can parameterize a tautology by the number of propositions that appear in it. Um, and this number is going to be n. And now we can ask about how long, wide, spacious is its proof as a function of n, of the number of uh, um, propositions that appear there. OK, and, and, and we're going to look inside the propositional calculus. <coughs> Yeah, yeah. So uh, what is a tautology? It's some Boolean circuit that evaluates always to true on all possible in inputs. And the simplest uh, tautology, well, the simplest tautology is just the constant 1, true. But the second simplest tautology is this one. So you see, no matter what the proposition x is, uh, this statement, which you can think of it also as a circuit, um, it has an OR gate and then you know, a NOT gate and one input, this statement always will output 1, right? So, but you can get more complicated uh, tautologies by, you know, cooking up, uh, taking a few propositions and then putting a bit more ands and ors and, and, and negations, and it will still be always true. Um, we will actually be looking at contradictions, which are exactly the same as tautologies. Tautology is a circuit that evaluates always to zero and a sorry, evaluates always to one. Contradiction is something that evaluates always to zero, and. The reason we're going to look at it, so, so you know, if you just put a negation gate on top of a tautology, it becomes a contradiction and vice versa. So it really doesn't matter which one of them you study. But uh, because we'll be focusing on a very simple proof system that, uh, that is resolution, it works with contradictions. And moreover, we can assume that our contradiction is given in a very simple form. Uh, our Boolean circuit is just a 3CNF. So it is, there's a big conjunction, an AND of clauses, and each clause is an OR of uh, just three literals at most, and a literal is either a variable or it's negation. Here is one example of the kind of contradictions we'll be looking at. So formula is F, and it has um, one, two, three, four, five many clauses, and each clause has either two or three variables, and let's read what it says. It says, for this circuit to evaluate to one, you need each one of the clauses to evaluate to one. For this clause to value to 1, you need um, either x to be true or you need y to be false. We'll denote the negation of y by uh, you know, an underline. Or z needs to be true. And then to get this clause to be satisfied, you need um, either y or z to be false or 0. And here you need either w or y to be 1 and so on and so forth. OK, so is the definition of a CNF clear? Example, yeah, by example, you have um, a list of clauses. In each clause, you have to satisfy at least one literal. And satisfying a literal is setting it to true. 
You satisfy a positive literal by assigning the value true to it, and you satisfy a negative literal by assigning the value false to this literal. So going back to propositional proofs, how it relates to the previous thing is x, y, and z are things that you don't know whether they're going to be true or false, but no matter what they are, you're asserting that some combination of all of these must be either true or must be either false. Right. With a contradiction, what we want to do is prove, um, for instance, this is something we'll do later on, but um, we can even argue, you know, just looking at this and look into it a little bit, we'll see that no matter which way you assign uh, values to the four variables that you have here, x, y, z, and w, you will never get to satisfy all clauses. There always will be one clause that will not be set to true. All literals of it will be set to false. And in, in propositional proof complexity, we study the case where we get this big CNF with uh, many clauses, each uh, you know, over n variables, and it just happens to be unsatisfiable. There's no assignment that satisfies all clauses. And we would like a proof of this fact. You know. How do we know that it's uh, not satisfiable? We can always do it by exhaustive search, just go over all two to the n assignments. But we don't think of this as, you know, as really as a proof or as a meaningful proof. We're asking for cases where there is a more concise proof that says, oh, you know, well, look, you know, this formula is really the negation of that formula, and you can't have the formula true and its negation true, something like that. But things are sometimes more complicated than that. OK. So let's rephrase our questions again. Given a contradiction f, it's 3CNF formula, over n variables, how long can its proof be as a function of n? And we think of 2 to the n as the worst kind of case, because we can always go over all 2 to the n assignments and check them. So how long, how long can it prove that f is contradiction? Exactly, that there is no satisfying assignment. And you say 3 CNF because there is at most uh, three uh, variables yes. in each clause. At most three variables in each clause. Right, and by, um, um, I think, Cook's theorem, um, this is as general a case as you need to consider because the general case of Boolean circuit um, can be reduced to the case of a 3 CNF. So you can. And the number of clauses? The number of clauses can be at most something like n uh, cubed because there are at most uh, n cubed many variables. It's not a parameter, no. So, but it can't be too bad. It can, cannot be more than eight times, uh, um, eight times uh, n choose three, which is roughly n cubed. OK. So, uh, and then we'll compare you know, different kinds of complexities of proofs. OK. Uh, by the way, any questions, just stop and ask. So, but what is a proof? So I won't give a formal definition, though of course there exists one. I'll give you one example for one interesting proof system. Yes? But, I mean, so uh, uh, the Cook's theorem says something more general than what you claim, right? I mean, it really says that any generic, or if you sort of take the Turing hypothesis and so on, that any form of a proof can be converted into a propositional proof, or any form of, form of a theorem can be converted into a propositional contradiction. Right. The theorem is true if and only if this is a contradiction. and so if you can reason about this, then you can reason about that. Right, right. right. Well, it depends. The theorem, OK, if the theorem is, uh, let's say, in first order logic, then really you can translate it into an infinite sequence of, because one for every length. Uh, length. Once right. the length of the proof. Right. And this is something that, that's one of the motivations for studying propositional proof com complexity, because it tells you things about uh, statements, say, in first order logic, you know, because. Uh, they are related exactly in the way you said. OK, so what is a proof? I'll give one concrete uh, setting or one concrete example that we'll um, uh, investigate in this talk. And uh, this is the resolution proof system that was uh, first introduced in a PhD of a person called Blake from Chicago, 1937. Um, <coughs> and it's by far the most important propositional proof system, theoretically and practically. And um, the reason it's so important is it's very useful for automatization for running algorithms on it, precisely because it's a very simple proof system. So the kind of lines that you know, the, the prover can put on the board will always be clauses, nothing more. And there's just one deduction rule, one way you can derive new lemmas from existing one. And it's this simple rule. So if you have a clause that has in it the, very, the, the literal x, the positive literal x, and you have some other 
clause that has in it the negative li literal x. Then, hmm? ah, there's an underline here. So if you have a or x, and you have somewhere else b or not x, you can deduce from it that a or b must hold. And it can be seen, it's not very hard to see, that if you have an assignment that satisfies this and also satisfies this, it must satisfy this. Well, let's just see it, you know. Either it satisfies A, and then it satisfies this. Okay, if it doesn't satisfy A, but it satisfies this thing, it must satisfy X. If it satisfies X, it cannot satisfy not X. So it must satisfy B, and it satisfies this part. So any assignment that satisfies this clause and also this clause must satisfy this clause. So how does the proof go? You start by saying, oh, I need to satisfy all of these constraints. But I take two of them, they imply one other constraint. Then I take some other two and they apply another constraint. And I keep on in this way till I end up, notice that the variable x now just disappeared. So I can just keep throwing out variables for my clauses until I end up with the case where I just have a clause that has x and I also have not x. And then I say, well, you know, there's no assignment that can satisfy x and also satisfy not x. Formally, you can just do one more resolution rule and end up with the um, empty uh, clause. Yes? Do you always assume three? I mean, is there any? Good question. No. So the axioms, our input, the set of axioms that we're looking at, will always be at most three. Maybe we'll, we'll set it later on to be four or some constant in this talk. But uh, along the way, we'll soon see there's some cases that you just must have lines that are going to be very wide. OK? <clears throat> so let's see our example, and now I'm going to prove to you that this is an unsatisfiable CNF. So here we just care about existence of a proof. Yes? Like we don't say anything about finding the proof. Excellent question. Right. The question of finding a proof is also investigated. That's a whole different ballgame. And in this respect, um, proof complexity looks at, let's say, the dark side of satisfiability. So in proof, in proof complexity, something like an NP language is easy because what is an NP language? You know, something is in the language if it has a witness, and the witness is short always. So, you know, does it have a proof? By definition, it has. You know, if a graph is three colorable, can someone prove it to you easily? Sure, he just gives you the three coloring. Here, in this case, we're asking about the opposite case. Let's say if a graph is not three colorable, you know, can someone even prove that to you very easily? So, not always. <coughs> OK, so let me prove to you, using just this one resolution rule, let me prove to you that this formula is unsatisfiable. And what we'll do is uh, suppose I had uh, a blackboard, and we'll take a snapshot after each time I write down a clause or uh, remove a clause uh, from, from the proof. And this way, we'll get to measure both, uh, I mean, all of the parameters we care about, the width, the space, and the length. So the first thing I do is, I mean, this is, let's say, written on some unerasable you know, part of the wall. It's written over here. Um, and then I'll be working with the whiteboard, but uh, you know, we'll do it faster over here. So the first thing I do is, I, okay, I start with the empty board, and uh, that's our initial configuration, our initial snapshot, and then I just uh, download one of the axioms. I mean, I, this is like one of the axioms. I say, well, we have this constraint. I write it down. Then I write uh, this constraint. Now I can apply the resolution rule with respect to this variable w. Right? And I can argue, well, you know, it must be the case that, I mean, any assignment that satisfies this and this must also satisfy y. So y is also something that we deduce must be always set to true. Now, um, let me erase these. I don't need them anymore. I mean, those, they're still written up here, but they're not written anymore on the board. Okay? And then I write, I copy down three clauses from up here. You don't need them because it so happens. In this particular proof, right now, I don't need them. It could be the case, and it often is the case that, uh, you know, later on, I'll need them again. But, you know, I want to save space. So, so I want to save space. I want to so space it's width. Not, it's not that in general you can erase the, the, the upper two. No. In, no. Often, there are many cases where you can never get to do the proof without reusing some line many times, right? So now I record down three clauses uh, in three steps. So we took here three snapshots. And now I apply resolution to remove, uh, let me get, remember. So I'm deducing this clause. And the way I do it is I guess I get rid of the z variable, right? So I take these two. And I say here the z is uh, uh, negative. Here it's positive. I can just strike it out and take the union of what remains. So I get x or not y. 
And remember, I still remember this Y, this, this, this lemma. I still have it on the board. Now I can throw away these two things. I don't need them anymore. And now I, I, here I have X and I have not X. So let me just do one more resolution and, and get not Y, right? If I cut, if I do resolution on these two things, I'll deduce not Y. And now I'm almost done because I reached a point where, you know, I throw these away. I have Y and I have not Y. And now one more line, I cut them together. I get the empty clause, which can never be satisfied. And I erase everything else from the board and I'm done. So it took me 12 steps, 12 Final step, you always want it to be zero. Yes. And the first step is always the empty set. Right. Okay. Yes. Uh, since, like, from a total outside perspective, how would you write down if something like Fermat's last theorem or like this curve is not three colorable in this propositional language? Let me say Fermat's last theorem. So what I would do is, um, right, I have A to the N plus B to the N plus C to the N. So let me take the contradiction. So let me say A to the N. Oh, no, I'll say something like this. N greater than three. That's one condition I have. And then I'll say, um, sorry, uh, n greater than 2. Uh, I want something that encodes a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n. Now it's a contradiction. So what I do is I, I, I have these circuits for computing what happens when you take a. So, so now I'll fix the bit length. Let's say I'll work only with numbers that are up to 1,000 bits. So a is a 1,000-bit number, n is a 1,000-bit number, b is a 1,000-bit number, and c is. Now, there's some circuit. It's, it's actually polynomial in, in, in the number of bits. That what it does, it raises to a power. There's circuits for additions. I just write this whole big circuit. And there's a circuit that checks if a number is greater than 3, right? Sort of more abstractly, a proof is given by um, an algorithm which will check it. So it will read whatever you write as a theorem. It will read whatever you write as a proof. The algorithm will just grind over this and say at the end, yes, these two are consistent. Everything that you claim is somehow or the other in the way that we specified, derived from what I know as axioms and what I know as deduction rules and what was the proposition uh, in simple steps. So uh, the algorithm specifies this thing. Then you can basically say these kinds of things are derived by saying, well, I just look at whatever <coughs> the algorithm could have had in its state of, at any stage of mind. And each point, one of these desires is some proposition saying at the 15th time step, this algorithm would have written zero in the cell, 17th cell location. That's a proposition. And you just ask the question, is there a collection of propositions which would put together imply that the algorithm will accept? That somehow corresponds to these kinds of things. So everything gets transformed into simple verifying that this formula is never satisfiable. And, and so now, like, the, the key step that makes it interesting is that, like, going from that to this is easy relative to proving this. Right. So this is automated, it's quick, and it doesn't blow up anything by much. But now, if you want to prove this thing with the sequence of steps, maybe it will take a long time, maybe it will be short. We don't know. If it can be done with as many steps as the number of variables, then even proving the theorem might be easy. Okay, so formally, the, now that we saw an example, formally a resolution, a refutation, or proof, sometimes it's called refutation because you're refuting the fact that F is satisfiable, is a sequence of snapshots. Each uh, snapshot is just a set of clauses, what's written on the board at time i. And there are three conditions. You start with the empty board, you end with the empty clause, the contradiction. And in the middle, you can derive a set from what's written previously on the board only by erasing some stuff, by copying some stuff from, from some axioms, or by applying a resolution inference to things that are right now on the board. Okay. And you can then now simultaneously can download as many. Yeah, we can, uh, yeah, or you, you can say that you're allowed to download at most one. It will okay. change by a factor. Uh, we'll be looking at. Yeah, let's say you can download only one thing at a time. So here I did three downloads, but I, uh, yeah, I incremented by three. Okay. Uh, other? <coughs> Brendan, you have a? Well, it's just yeah. this question, you know, does the download uh, add a line to the proof? Does that count towards your, your complexity? Let's say that it does, yes. Does it add one or does it add, say, like in this case, six, because you're making a decision which 
No, no, let's say that it adds one. But here what I did is I downloaded three things, so I just said, uh, you know, I incremented it by three. But like if, for example, I downloaded the wrong thing, I might have had a much longer thing. So the game we're playing here is suppose the professor already found out the best proof and he's presenting it to us. So we're looking at the best possible proof. So it's the shortest. If he downloaded these things, we trust him that this is the most efficient way to get at the proof. And we'll still be bounding it from below and saying, well, in some cases, it's just going to be complicated, even when you try to find the best kind of proof. OK, so now um, the length of a refutation is the number of snapshots. The width is the maximal width of a, a single line, how many variables appear in it. The worst uh, line, I mean, the fattest line on the board. And the space is what's the maximal number of lines that appear simultaneously on the board. Clause. A line is a clause, and its width is how many variables appear in it. So if we're assuming that our professor only writes one line, you know, he never breaks a, a line into two, then how wide should the board be? So S7 is one. I'm still mm -hmm. confused. You're going to do it in S7, this example? S7 yeah. is one. Mm -hmm. So here the length is 12. The width is uh, three. You never have a clause of length more than three. Right, uh, I mean three. Three, three, the num <coughs> is the maximum number of variables. In a particular in, in, in Right, particular so in this case, the width is really, you know, great because uh, it's three and, uh, I mean, there are some clauses that are width three, but we'll soon see that it sometimes gets much worse. And the space is five, but I guess. You cannot have more variables than you have in the original one. Um, yes. Right, it's but. It's uh, bigger than n, yes? Like the width it cannot be bigger than n. Okay, right, the width cannot be bigger than n, but it can be bigger than three. Than the maximum uh, clause width that you have right. in the inputs. Yes. Yes. Maybe we get in three. Yes. For instance, if I would take, uh, well, I'm trying to see. Here it can be bigger than three because I have just four variables. So, you know, if I, if I do resolution, I always remove one variable. But if I had like 10 variables, yeah. I could, you know, maybe I have x1, x2, x3. And then I have not x3, x4, x5. So if I do resolution on them, I remove x3, but I end up with x1, x2, x4, x5. But I thought n is the total number of variables in, the, in, in f. Right. right. Yeah. So, so it will so never be more than n? It cannot be more than n. It cannot be more than n. But it can be more than three. But it can be more than three, <laughs> right. And in this case, uh, yeah, this is misleading in that respect, because here, uh, if you have just four variables, it can't be more than three, but in general, it can't. OK, and, and the length of a formula the inherent length of the formula is, you know, what is the minimal length of a refutation? So when you try to optimize the length, what is the minimum? And similarly with space and width. If you try to save space as much as you can, you know, what's the minimum that you need? Same with it's width. Confusing. The length is small, the space is small, the width is small, but not simultaneously. Yes. Um, well, that's what's also conceivable. In some cases it is. Uh, and we want to understand, yeah, in which right. cases uh, it is. As definition defined, it doesn't imply that the space is, you fix a single proof and then say what's the length, width, space, and width of the same thing, but rather when you want to measure length, you take the best proof for length. Right. Okay. There are also, people also look at, suppose you want to optimize two things at the same time. You want something that will be short and will use small space. People so have looked. I don't understand what, so snapshots, here it's 12 snapshots. Right. Right, so, so what, is, what is space? Space is, uh, suppose each uh, um, snapshot uh, is a sequence of, of lines. You know, one line. Oh, on snapshot is not a line. A snapshot is not a line. Space. Space. So snapshot, uh, snapshot is a number of lines. Space is a number of clauses in a line. No, 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 but I'm asking what is a snapshot? Uh, length is the number of snapshots. Every line here on the board is a snapshot. So it's what right. is the difference between space and length? Maximum of number of lines in a single snap. Ah, no, no. Okay, he's using mean? lines to mean different things than the lines yes. on this yes. white. The, yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah, I'm conf This has two lines. This is one snapshot, and oh, it has I two see. lines. Okay. Right. So, yeah. This has three lines, and the worst case in this proof is this has five lines. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, the first question we want to know is how bad uh, can a refutation be? Sorry, I have one more question. Yes. So why do we care that much for, uh, like for the width? Like it seems that n is, like if you talk about automated proving, n should be, like it is a good bound. Like, but it's 
So when does it come up when you actually care about the it's a good question, okay. Uh, we'll see soon. Yeah, width seems like, you know, you care about space, you care about length, why do you care about width? But it turns out that width is, is, is very uh, important and we'll get to that, so. But, um, so it's not hard to see that the length is at most two to the n and it's not hard to see, we already discussed this, the width, no line can have more than n variables. Turns out that the space, you never need more than n lines on the board at one time. And this is a bit more tricky to see but it was done in, in this paper by Esteban and Toran, who introduced the uh, space and first discussed it. Um, now, lower bounds. So it turns out uh, the celebrated lower bound, the first lower bound on resolution from 85 of Haken, shows that in some cases the length can be 2 to the omega of n, which basically means that for some cases you cannot do any better than just exhaustive search. I mean, any proof in resolution doesn't give you more information than just checking all possibilities. <coughs> and since then, we know already of many, many examples uh, for which you need exponential length. The width can be at least uh, omega of n. This was first used by Tzaitin in 68. Uh, Galil also observed it in 79. And uh, in my work with Vigdelson, which I'll come to later, we showed that actually width is a very good way to get space low, uh, length lower bounds. And the space can be also omega of n. This is in work with Alechnovich, Rosborov, and Wigdelson. So the, each one of them individually can be as bad as possible. And for instance, the above, the worst case holds for, for instance, for random 3CNF. So random 3CNF is you take n variables, you pick, uh, let's say, five times n clauses at random, and how do you pick a clause? You just pick three literals at random, and you set their signs at random. If you take five n many clauses, it's not hard to see that it will be unsatisfiable with high probability, and moreover, um, it's much harder to see, but we'll discuss this, uh, that it has uh, these bounds on the space. You can't do anything better than just exhaustively writing. So any proof for a random 3CNF will just be horrible. And when you come out of it, you'll say, oh, you know, this wasn't any better than just saying, let's try the first assignment, let's try the second, you know, all the way to the last one and just see that they, they're, none of them is good. Yes? Are there other proof systems for which those 3CNFs are easier? Are there other proof systems for Okay, for these, with 5N clauses, uh, I didn't, five in clauses, nothing is known. So we only know of cases, several proof systems for which it's hard. There are many cases for which we don't even know to prove that it's hard, though we believe. I guess it's a reasonable conjecture to believe that for any proof system, a 3CNF is, is random 3CNF is hard to prove. Um, but we don't, we're, you know, eons away from understanding this statement. Um, and we don't know of a single case where, where it's known to be easy. If you increase the density, the, the ratio of clauses to variables significantly, then uh, it does become... If it is easy for some proof system to prove that clauses of length 5n are... all things of length 5n are easy, that implies np equals to np. So it is... A no, but it's only false for random. So that's right. for, for random, it's a different story. But no, no, yeah, yeah, for the random case. I, for the random case, we don't know of any. <coughs> if you take, I, I forgot what the best, like the world record is. It may be some huge constant or maybe slightly more. What? I think n to the 1.4, uh, you need n to the 1.4 clauses before like the, the Frege came The spe spectral, but didn't they reduce it a little bit? Uh, n to the 1.4? 1.5 spectral techniques, they need n to the 1.5 clauses, and n to the 1.4, is you can still do it. There is some kind of, I don't know if it's like a general purpose proof system, but there is some kind of certificate that uh, random, uh, random uh, 3 CNFs of uh, n to the 1.4 clauses are not satisfiable by Fege, Kim, and Offer. And which one, the virtual proof system? It's not really a proof system, it's like a, they show a certification. Uh, like, uh, There's some later work that shows that uh, if you want a proof system, it will be TC0 Frege, which is like resolution, but the lines can be not just clauses, they can be bounded depth threshold. Uh, this is work by um, I think Samerit and uh, I forgot. It's something pretty recent that you can formalize the spectral techniques using um, bounded depth threshold uh, formulas. Stupid question. If you want to check all possibilities, yes, yes. how would you formalize it? Yeah, okay. that's my question. Um, what you would do is, uh, it, it would be a little bit tricky, but here's what you would do. Take the, like, take a, you know, first branch on x1, then branch on x2. You get a tree of size 2 to the n. Now along each branch, 
at some point you'll reach a clause that's not satisfied, right? But the branch is not part of the statement. No, I'm just saying here's a way to construct, let's say, a proof of length at most two to the n. So you just, first of all, just write this the full binary tree, okay? So do you assign to x1, do you assign it 0 or 1, then to x2? But, but it's not part of your formal... Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, I have, I, have a, I have a CNF over n variables, okay? I want to construct a proof that it will be of size at most 2 to the n. So here's the way you do it. You first write this full binary tree, okay? W without even looking at the, 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 the set of clauses. Now, along each path, because the formula is unsatisfiable, along each path there will be some point, the first time where some clause in your set is set to, f to zero. You write down the clause there, and now this is, uh, you, I'll edit, you know, uh, for, for offline, for checking, that if you look at this tree, um, you know, if you took a look at two leaves, you can resolve them and get uh, the negation of the path leading to, so you can, if you just start with this thing, you can fill it up into a full resolution proof. On the, along the bottom line, writing <coughs> down each one of these uh, clauses as you see and then resolving and so on will give you a resolution proof. Right. And you even get to hang them some, you know, if, if I have the, 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 for, uh, the clause x1, x2, x3, there'll be some path of length 3 um, that I can put a clause over there. Right. And this turns out to be a proof. Okay. So just a little bit of motivation. Why do we care about resolution uh, complexity of proofs? So it turns out that all state-of-the-art uh, SAT solvers, and there are many of them, you know, there's a yearly competition, there's a huge industry that tries to optimize SAT solvers, and it's, you know, it's also a multi-million or billion dollar business. Um, and all state-of-the-art SAT solvers invariably use resolution. What do I mean by that? When you give to them an unsatisfiable CNF and they finish their running time. You can look at the transcript of what happened. They usually branch and you know, check and assign variables and simplify things. You can take this transcript, and from it, you can cook up a resolution proof. So for instance, if we have a formula that has no short resolution proofs, it means that these algorithms will not be efficient. And similarly, you can talk about space and width. They also mean things. Um, for instance, the width means that certain heuristics that try to look for easy contradictions. There's something called clause uh, learning, which is, you know, if you try assigning variables and you reach a contradiction, you try to add to your set of constraints some new clause that you learned. This is a very powerful paradigm. Turns out, and usually you want to learn something with few variables. So if you just um, learn things with few variables, you're looking at proofs that have very small width, in which case, um, you know, the algorithms will run pretty bad. But also, as we already described, you can take mathematical statements and convert them into um, propositional statements, like we said for, for Fermat's last theorem. And it turns out if you can show uh, lower bounds on proof complexity, it means something about the hardness of proving these statements. So for instance, we have some work that shows that you, know, you cannot prove the analog of NP doesn't equal co-NP. Sorry, I think it's NP doesn't equal P. But you can formulate the same thing for NP versus coin P. You cannot prove it in resolution. And a big challenge is to get uh, the same statement for stronger proof systems and show that you know, P versus NP is, is hard as a statement. It's not just that we're not you know, smart enough to prove it. Can you say it has a finite version? This is just being able to write it down? Yes, you can have finite versions of any mathematical statement. You'll say something like, let's look at the SAT formula over n variables. It's a, its truth table is of length 2 to the n. Right. Now let's look at circuits of size n to the 10. You know, you want to show that no circuit of size n to the 10 will give you um, a, a truth table that equals SAT. So you end up with some CNF that it has 2 to the n clauses. But what we show is that its proof length will be much more than 2 to the n. It will be exponential in that. OK? So it tells you something I mean about it. So let's say you would like to just ask the question like, is P equal to coin P? Yes. Okay? And so then like, if you are able to prove that there is no, like even uh, like, there is no, no short res resolution proof of that, then uh, like, okay. So what the last seems to be saying, I think, is that if P versus, if the statement P is not equal to NP, has a proof which is about a thousand pages long, then it might take you two to the thousand time to discover it. 
Is that roughly what it's saying, or is it? It's more that it's the, the game is more uh, the game for, with res resolution is a bit too weak a system. But if you go to slightly stronger systems, you get to say things like that. Suppose there is a proof of p not equals n p in this fragment of arithmetic. So like in real math, you know, but it uses only simple, simple things. Yeah. I think I don't understand. It's just the following. So, so if <coughs> you assume that p is equal to cosine p, and you have an algorithm which can, you know, give in, in a formula and mm -hmm. will prove to you, do you check whether this is, you know, this is, that will will decide that this is, uh, you know, unsatisfiable or not? Mm -hmm. So then, what, like, if you have an algorithm, then from what you s seem to say is that you can actually, you know, algorithm is a circuit, and right. then you can actually, you know, use it to obtain a. Oh no! You just obtain the set of okay. You, you want the proof, formula to want the resolution. Okay, yeah, sure. And so, okay. Okay, um, and the last thing is just philosophically. I mean, if if a proof is complicated, then it means you know philosophically that the formula um, is just you know damn hard. You just can't prove it easily. It's it's not something about you know you don't have to search for a simpler proof. Some statements are just by chance. Uh, let's say, unsatisfiable. And this is very perplexing for complexity theorists. I mean, maybe just, you know, why? You think, what is NP? Uh, uh, sorry, the conjecture P equals NP. It means that there's some clever way to look at a CNF and, you know, just based on its st structure, just to know whether it's satisfiable or not. And this sort of thing hints at, you know, no, you just, sometimes you just, at least proving it within this simple proof system, you can't do any better than exhaustively checking. So, okay. So we finished first part of the plan, which is just you know to discuss what is proof of complexity about. I tend to finish it around 515. Or so, so yeah. yeah. Okay, I can 515. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So what is <coughs> the simplest uh, you know uh, proof system that is not known to be like polynomially equivalent to resolution? Oh, there are many. Um, no, no. You have if you 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 can augment it a little bit. Like uh, one way to augment it is to say, yeah, you can first of all um, have things like uh, even if you're just within the logical framework where all you write down as lines are um, you know logical formulas. So if you allow not clauses but let's say an or of the end of two variables, okay, then there are things that are very hard for resolution but become very easy. So almost any way you tweak it, uh, you get things that are stronger and there are separations and... Uh, yeah, yeah, this is proven. I mean, if, uh, it, it, our understanding of proof of complexity ends very quickly. You know, if you go about bounded depth formulas, nothing is known. We don't even have, we don't even know that there exists some formula that's hard. Um, yeah, it's... If you stay close enough to resolution, you can still work very hard, and and and, and you'll get some uh, understanding. Okay. <coughs> so I want to talk now about uh, you know graph expansion and how it plays a role in proving that for certain formulas are hard to uh, prove inherently. So first we have to define a graph given a CNF, and we'll do it in a very straightforward way. Uh, we'll put we'll do a bipartite graph. On the left hand side, we'll put one vertex for a clause. On the right hand, we'll put one vertex for each variable, and we'll connect the clause to the variables appearing in it. And we don't care at all if it's a positive literal or a negative literal. So for instance, this is our CNF, the one that we discussed all the time. It's unsatisfiable. And it has four variables. And uh, you know, x, y, z is connected to x, y, and, and z. OK, so this is the graph. What is expansion? It is, I just want to say, it's the standard definition of bipartite expansion. So we say that the graph is RC expanding if for all subsets of the left-hand side that have at most R vertices in them, the size of their neighborhood is much greater than they are. So the number of neighbors they have or the number of variables this subformula mentions is more than 1 plus C times its size. So every set of clauses uh, has a lot of variables in it. And a formula is expanding, RC expanding, if the graph associated with it is expanding. And here's a theorem. If you have a formula that's very expanding, so all subsets up to a constant fraction of the number of variables are expanding for some C that's greater than 0, um, then its width is uh, linear and um, its length is exponential. So this is work with uh, Vigdelson. 
This is celebrated result of Kvatel and Semeredi, but I'll soon show you how it follows from this thing. And this answers the question, you know, why do we care about width? And uh, the space uh, is also as bad as possible. Um, this is work with uh, Nicola Galesi. <coughs> and it all falls down to expansion. And let me just mention that expansion also explains uh, hardness of, of, of proving stuff in, in stronger proof systems, such as polynomial calculus <coughs> and uh, down the depth figure. Yes? So every vertex on the left has at most three right. neighbors. And the maximum you can hope C to be is like two. two. Right. Okay. But it's going to be some number just barely positive as opposed to yes. one no, or two. And also the fact that random uh, sat formulas are hard is, this is it, like if you take a random graph, then it will be expanded. Like right. So here is what oh. you're saying. Random 3CNF is, is expanding with high probability. This is uh, relatively, I mean, it's you know, was first shown, I think, here, but it's relatively straightforward. And um, it implies that the random 3CNF is as hard as you can think it is. <coughs> so uh, let me discuss the width method and, and show you why width is interesting, because um, it can be used to show that uh, length is hard. And this is a theorem I won't prove. But um, it says the following. If you can prove a lower bound on the width, and if this lower bound is linear, then the length is going to be exponential in the width squared divided by n. So if this is uh, omega of n, what you get here is the length is exponential in n, right? So this I won't prove. Um, but let me just show you now, and I'll also move to the whiteboard. Let me show you now why, uh, how you get to, uh, for instance, show that uh, an expanding CNF has a uh, large width. Linear. Linear width. So um, we'll define this uh, measure, mu, mu of c, for any clause c. It's the minimal subset of the formula F that you need in order to imply C. What do I mean by imply? I mean it is the minimal subset such that any assignment to the subset satisfies C. So, so C is not a clause of F. Not necessarily, right. So uh, we say that F prime implies C if uh, for all assignments alpha, um, if F of alpha is true, then also C of alpha must be true. And we take the minimal size needed for it. OK, so what about uh, an axiom, a clause that appears in F? What is mu of an axiom? One, One right? Because you just take that clause, it implies it. This is more tricky. The minimal number of clauses you need in order to imply contradiction, or the minimal unsatisfiable CNF must have at least R clauses. R is this expansion uh, boundary. Up, every, all, set, all sets of clauses with less than R clauses in them have more variables than clauses. So why are they satisfiable? Because each clause just gets rid of one assignment. Right, so we'll use here Hall's matching theorem. Hall's theorem that says, I'll just use one side of it. If uh, for all V prime subset of V, the neighbors of V prime, the size of the neighborhood is greater than the size of V, then there exists a one-to-one, um, -one, there exists a one-to-one -one mapping from V you mean matching. matching. Right, the matching from V to uh, neighbors of V. So in our case, if you give me a set that has less than R clauses in it, there will be some matching from the clauses to the variables, which means each clause can pick one variable and say, this is my variable. You know, I get to decide on it. Now, f to satisfy a clause, I only need to satisfy one literal in it. So if each clause gets to pick its favorite you know, one variable, it's satisfiable. Hence, um, to reach the empty clause, we need at least R. So this you need only for C greater than or equal to 0. Was right. C strictly greater than 0 in your? Stri C is going to be strictly greater than 0. Uh, we'll see this in a minute. So now let's talk about the subadditivity. If I derived A or B from, by one resolution step, the measure, the number of clauses I need to, to imply A or B is at most the sum of the two things I use. Why? Because I can just take, if I have a bunch of clauses implying A or X, a bunch of clauses implying 
B or not X, I just take their union, clearly it implies uh, A or B. So it can only be less than that. And if you combine these things together, you conclude that there must be some clause in the proof that has the right measure. It is sort of this medium complexity clause. You don't need more than two-thirds R, but you certainly need more than R over three. And R is some fraction of N. It's a pretty large set. So all we have to do now is show that the width of C, the number of variables that appear in it, must be at least R over R C over three, and that's omega of N. So any suggestions? How would we go about that? Let me draw the situation. Here we have some F prime, and here we have the neighborhood of F prime, the number of variables appearing in it, and it's much larger. I mean, the size of the neighborhood is greater than 1 plus C times the size of F prime. And we know that F prime implies C, but you cannot remove any one clause from it and still get to imply C. So what would we do? So, okay, this is going to be a bit tricky, so let me do it. Let us take, um, let us put a restriction. So let us assign variables. And what variables are we going to assign? If C, you know, let's suppose that C without loss of generality is X1 or X2 or da-da-da up to some XW. Okay? So what we'll do is let's set all of these to zero. Okay? Now let's see what happens to both sides. This becomes zero. And this becomes F prime restricted to, you know, some restriction, this restriction law. So what does it mean? Uh, I remove some clauses and some other clauses. Uh, any clause that has X1 in it, I just remove X1 from it. But it can be argued, and it's not too hard to show, that this still implies this. And moreover, it implies it minimally. You cannot, if you remove any one clause from this set, it will not imply the empty set. Why? Because if it had it implied the empty set, when I removed this restriction, I would have gotten a smaller um, subformula that implies C. And now there's this theorem that uses, once again, Hall's, theor uh, Hall's matching theorem. There's this theorem, it's sort of folklore, that says um, if F is unsatisfiable, is a minimal unsatisfiable, then it has more clauses than variables. So what we end up with is seeing that F, once you restricted it by rho, should have less variables than 1 times F. So you must have killed C times F variables. So w is at least C times. Right. So you conclude that W must be at least C times the size of F, which is uh, C times R over 3. That's what's there. So, so what, did we learn? what did we learn? If we have an expanding CNF, it must contain, any proof of an expanding CNF must contain a clause that is very wide. And then there's this theorem that says if that's the case, if every proof must have a wide clause, then the proof cannot be simple, it must be complicated. Okay. What is the general tool that you use? Okay, there is there It's not complicated, but uh, it's not, uh, you know, it will take me like 15 minutes to do it properly. But it's not, I can, I can tell you later on. It's not, no, it's not algebraic geometry. It's okay. from <laughs> basic principles. Okay. What is the length? <laughs> what? What's the length of this proof? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's short. <laughs> okay, so I won't have much time to talk about this. Um, Let's look at trade-offs. So I want to say, first of all, we already saw one trade-off. And that's that short proofs are narrow. So the theorem that we saw before, you know, we can just uh, take logs and uh, restate it in this way. So the width is at most square root of n log the length. So in other words, if you have a short proof, then you have a narrow proof. If there is a proof that's very short, fits in this thing, then you can prove it with a board that can be very narrow. It, it might be long, but, but it, you know, it might need a lot of space, but it's always going to be narrow. Okay? So, so 
Short implies narrow. There are also trade-offs, but I, I, I didn't state them yet. Uh, but but it's not a trade-off so far. Well, it, uh, okay, it's right. Actually, it seems like narrow should imply short because there aren't so many narrow clauses, right? Very narrow. So if uh, you know, if uh, there is a proof of width uh, ten, then the, uh, there is a proof of length at most n to the ten, right? And this actually does give you, uh, you know, some meaningful. Uh, um, upper bounds and also automatizable, uh, what's called automatizable, so algorithms for finding proofs that will be efficient. Uh, you just describe one. You say, let's just restrict the width to be at most 10 and try to derive everything we can, but only keep things that have at most 10 variables in it. So your running time will be at most n to the 10. And uh, this is a pretty decent uh, algorithm. Um, OK, so width versus space. Well, space-efficient proofs are narrow. So here's the picture that goes with it. Um, if, you need, um, if you need a board that's this wide, you can never get your proof uh, you know, in a sh with few lines. If you're going to need this much, if you're going to need uh, lines that are this wide, you better have your board at least as long. The space is always greater than the width. This is a beautiful theorem of Atsirias and Dalmau that Again, has this neat, uh, you know, 15-minute provable statement, but I won't go into it. And uh, what about length and ver width versus space? Well, short proofs need not be space efficient. Um, so this is a theorem with Jakob Nordstrom. It could be the case that a proof is very short and also very narrow, but its space is as bad as it can be. So the width can be as small as 10, the length could be 10 times n, but the space is uh, n over log n. And n over log n is, is the worst possible thing for a proof of length n. There's a different statement from the 70s that any implies that any proof that takes n steps can be done in space n over log n. So in some cases, you need that. I remember again what space was. So space was I was writing a class, one class per line. Yes. But then I'm allowed to erase and then move right. things upwards and right. so on. Okay. Right. It's the number of uh, lines you need. It's the number of things you need to keep consecutively right in your mind uh, to, to get the proof completed. So a proof can be very short, and each line can be very simple, but uh, it would be you know you need to remember a lot of stuff. So, so, so the length is like the size of the library. Uh, the space is the number of books I'm allowed to check out, and the width is the length of a book. Right? I mean, it's sort of how about <laughs> Okay, book that's for very complicated proofs where you know each <laughs> proof is a book. It's less complicated. <laughs> I don't want to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to get at uh, these trade-offs. And uh, so here we, are, we also have trade-offs that I, I didn't write down, but I, I'll just say them. You know, you can have cases where there's a proof that can be very short. If you want it to be space efficient, you can also make it very space efficient. But if you want it to be both short and space efficient, you can't do that. So they come one at the price of the other. And the same thing with uh, length and width and space and width. There are all kinds of trade-offs. In terms of the systems you talked in the beginning. For, uh, important for who? For, uh, for, for proof complexity people? For SAT solving uh, community? For uh, uh, whatever you choose. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that people first looked at and the, the most fundamental complexity measure is length. You know, how long is a proof? And the others are like tools to get it. Width uh, could be thought in that way. Uh, space. space is important, yes, like for sat solvers. Right. Uh, so, for instance, if you talk to practitioners, they'll tell you that uh, space is a big, big memory consumption is, is much, uh, much more important than, than running time, uh, in their experience. Could they measure of space, maybe space times width, right? Um, no, uh, only, yeah, but, but like, clearly I know, and I talked to some people at Microsoft Redmond, so space is the big issue, because actually you will. Like they are, it, it's you know you can run your uh, computer like ten times as long, but you know you can if it has more uh, space uh, space requirement, you would need to you know add a different computer to to do it. 
do this also. They prefer right. to have no, 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 longer but, proofs. But, but the, the natural notion of what do you need to store in memory oh, is, yes. is space by it's sort of the size of the black hole. But, but nowadays, what they do is this thing called clause learning. So what you do is you s decide that once in a while, you, you, know, you just deduce some new clause and add it to your CNF. Say, this is a new axiom. And then there is a big uh, line of research that looks at you know, which clauses do you want to remember. They, well, the, the, shorter, the narrower they are, the more useful they are, because you want to use them later on to prune some search uh, path and say, oh, we don't need to go further. So you want them to be uh, not wide. Uh, you, you would like to keep all of them, but this causes space considerations. So what they mean by space um, and what uh, we mean by space are very closely related, but uh, um, and, I, and I know that my co-author, Jacob, and is talking to some people who are more on the practical side and like they're running experiments and also trying to figure out, you know, what exactly, when we say space and when, when they say space, how do these two things relate? They surely relate, but uh, that needs uh, more exploration. Um, so th the key observation here is that if you want to understand uh, space versus length, you're looking at something that's very similar to space versus time trade-offs that have looked, been looked at in computational complexity. And you want to use similar tools, and most notably this thing which is uh, graph pebbling. This is something I suggested in 2002. And what's pebbling, so I like this uh, phrase, pebbled is what you get when you don't have enough grass to get stoned. <laughs> I'm now a Microsoft employee. I want to say that uh, you know, this is not Microsoft policy. It doesn't endorse the <laughs> statement. It does not endorse pebbling or stoning. It does not em endorse, right. Pebbling or stoning, okay, but it's it's a statement that's out there. Um, it's a game played on graphs introduced uh, by Patterson and Hewitt in 1970 and really investigated very intensively. And uh, there are surveys about it, uh, Pebbling, uh, you know, Pippinger in the 80s, and there's a recent uh, survey that talks about its implications to proof complexity by uh, Nordstrom. And uh, I won't say more about this. Uh, I'll. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I don't want to, you know, very interesting, very nice, but uh, uh, there's a game here that can be played and uh, lots of nice riddles and theorems about it. But I think I'll, I'll stop here. So should, yeah. What was the final theorem in this direction? Can you say, well, what was the summary? Okay, this one here. I see. Well, this is the statement that it says that uh, uh, there's this tool used uh, to understand trade-offs between length and space and length and width. And this tool says, let's take some notion that's called uh, pebbling and convert it somehow into a CNF in all kinds of ways. And then, uh, mysteriously, the kind of trade-offs that you saw for the graph used to study time-space trade-offs now gets transferred to uh, things like length and, and space. And uh, it's not too complicated, but uh, given the hour, I, I'd rather you know, stop here and just, if anyone's interested, I'll be happy to say more about it. Thanks. Okay. Let me just go to the last slide. There's some way to go. Yeah, so what we saw, the structure of mathematical statements sometimes means that it's hard to prove them. We wanted, OK, we talked about expansion, that it's very important for understanding what things are hard to prove. We didn't get to talk about how pebbling allows you to um, compare different complexity measures. And if there's time remaining, I describe uh, some accessible open problems. Okay, thanks. You already clapped, so you don't need to clap again. Yeah. Okay, I want to understand this, the first statement. We saw the structure, the mathematical the structure, I mean the graph structure. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, let me rephrase. <coughs> um, if a CNF, you know, when you look at it, you convert it into this bipartite graph, if it's expanding, then it's going to be yeah, hard to prove. That's that minimal structure. Right. So some stru there are other structures known out there, but this is one uh, very convenient one that uh, is embedded in many hard things. There's um, no converse which says <coughs> this graph is actually not an expander, and I even give you a very nice... The problem with non-expanding is that it's, expansion is something so that's very easy to ruin. I right? I can take an expander. For instance, I can take... Um, so to, to show that it's, that it's expanding graph, is it difficult or no straightforward? Uh, you can test it. Um, there are some spectral methods that will uh, give you guarantees on, you know, not tight. You can't compute exactly the expansion without going over all sets. But there are some cases where you can get 
guarantees uh, um, some spectral methods that will tell you about uh, uh, a good estimation on how expanding a CNF is. En enough to, to know that, enough to apply. Yes, in certain so cases, enough to, that you, you, you show, compute this uh, spectral this thing. You go to some matrix, you compute its eigenvalues, and, and uh, you look at this, you know, the first one and the second one, you compare them, and for certain cases, that will tell you that this is a bad, uh, this is a bad CNF. Yeah. yeah, so to what extent the limitations based on the expanders apply to other systems? Yes. If you have, uh, I mean, yeah, I think you mentioned polynomial calculus. Yes. For that, that's also true. What about yes. uh, other things? Okay, there's uh, the ones, the next system, okay, for uh, polynomial calculus, um, so in work with uh, Russell and Pagliazzo, we once showed that exactly the same thing happens. If you have an expanding CNF, um, for, um, there's this one system called uh, bounded f frege, which is really at the verge of you know, our understanding. There's, there was like one lower bound for it, for the pigeonhole principle. And roughly in 2002, I showed that for a certain expanding CNF, a very carefully chosen one that has XORs in it, if it's expanding, it's hard for the bounded depth frege. For instance, for bounded depth frege, an amazing open problem is what about the random CNF, random three CNF? We don't know to show that it is uh, uh, hard for, um, but we do know of, of, of ways to convert expansion into lower bounds for uh, bounded depth frege. And then there are other systems like cutting planes, which is a geometric proof system. Nothing is known, there's, no, there's nothing known about connection of expansion to lower bounds in cutting planes, though it must be true. Oh, there are some other, in cutting planes, people look at a, a weaker uh, estimate than length. It's called the rank. And for rank, you have things that are very similar. You have rank B is lower bounded by width. And uh, people even go to fancier, uh, sorry, more complicated um, geometric proof systems like the Lasser hierarchy, hierarchy and Lova Schreiber systems. And they can convert width bounds into um, what they call rank bounds, and it's roughly the number of times you need to lift and project or um, um, until you reach a, a contradiction. Right, for, for Lasser expansion implies, well, it doesn't imply length lower bounds. All of these bounds that look at geometric systems do not say anything about length, but they say something about, if you do it in rounds, uh, then the number of rounds is going to be linear. But, uh, which means like that sort of the depth of the proof, uh, the number of levels you apply your procedure is linear. But it's a big open problem, you know, uh, to show that it's a uh, length proof in cutting planes is, is exponential. It's not known. Yes? So, so <coughs> this expander lower bound, like it's actually like if you are a practitioner and you want to have the SATS solver and you want to make it resolution based, that's why it says it's no, because like usually like, People like in the practice sometimes don't care about NP hardness proofs uh, because you know they say, oh, okay, this is only for worst case instances. You know, we have easy instances. But now it shows that you know that there, you know, sometimes there is no way for them to do anything. So, so as long as they want to do resolution based uh, proofing, so is there some way that they can cheat inside? Like if they get random, so how do they solve random CNFs? Do they really have an exponential time algorithms? First, they don't solve random CNF uh, at some threshold or just hard. People in industry will tell you, you know, I don't care about random CNF. I care about things that come out of circuits. Now, how does a, you know, something like uh, whatever, uh, some circuit that does mul multiplication, how does it look like? Well, it has all of these components that are parallel and uh, they do the same thing. And also, um, the, you don't have a lot of room for choice because, you know, this gate must equal that gate and this gate must equal the XOR of these three gates. So what happens in, in practice is that often when you convert things to a three CNF, um, I mean, what's the problem with checking three CNFs? You know, you look at a clause, you, you look at the variable X1, you can set it to true, you can set it to false. What does it imply? Nothing yet. Uh, you go down this whole tree of setting things arbitrarily and you still see no structure. In, in industry-based things, there's a lot of structure. So you set the variable X1 to one, boom, you can set, you know, 10,000 variables implied by it. The expanding picture is that actually this graph is not expanding because it's it's certainly not, exp no, nothing that comes out of in industry is expanding, but what happens there is that you have, you know, there are these core variables, these decision places, that they are really important. Then you have thousands of variables that are like auxiliary and not, don't really, you don't care about them so much. And, and, but, but they still face the same problems, and 
eventually the way to deal with things like expansion and so on is to say, uh, I mean, ultimately you can't. I mean, it's NP and co-NP, you ultimately can't. But in practice, the way is to find more structure and to find um, ways uh, to add auxiliary variables. I mean, to do what mathematicians do, to say, well, here's an auxiliary construction. You know, you don't see it uh, immediately, but uh, if you view it slightly different, you get to reason about it, right? This is what we always do as mathematicians. So you would want automated ways to find out this. So they have some non-resolution based steps. Right, so these non-resolution based steps would be introducing new variables for circuits that encode, you know, this genius observation that you figured out that this variable and that variable are really, you know, the same or must always be negated. That's what they should be heading towards. I, you know, talking to them, that's what I tell them and, I mean, we've been exploring a little bit these things, but that's, and, and the big question is... So, if you, one of the things that Ellie didn't tell you is that pigeonhole principle is very hard to prove in resolution. So, if you think of yourself as being a mathematician who wants to prove the pigeonhole principle, try to imagine the steps you would take, and you'll see that resolution doesn't allow many of these steps. So. Yeah, I know, but like, the question is whether actually the SAT solvers use these steps, yes, because you, you mentioned that all the leading SAT solvers are, you know, resolution based, and I understood that they are strictly resolution based, so they don't cheat by just doing non resolution steps. No, right. But, but sometimes they do. So for the pigeonhole principle, what you would do, you would want some mechanism that finds that there are a lot of symmetries, right? There's a whole permutation group that works on it. And then uh, you would want to use that and say, I really don't need to check many things. Yeah, but, but, you know, but, so there are, like, but, you know, what, at first you mentioned that, you know, whenever this uh, SAT solver you know, finishes proving things, it will generate you the, you know, the resolution-based proof. But that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes they use some steps which are really uh, cheating steps. They're not, they're not that far away. They'll, say, they're call what, they'll use what's called like extended resolution. So you're allowed to add these extension variables. But once you, give, you, know, once you allow an algorithm to say, well, you get to define any circuit you want and any variables you want, then, then he's, the algorithm is in big trouble. What's the search space? I just want to know. Maybe we should take this offline now and thank Ali again. Yeah. Thank you.